and um, yeah, I'm a PhD student from King's College London, and I did leave for the money pool. Um, only the money. Um, <laughs> funding, alas, we know how it works. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to say a couple of words with Emily um, just before we start the panel because we came up with this idea together because we met at the Martial Arts Studies Conference two years ago. Um, and uh, the issue, the, both looking at themes of gender and empowerment and um, embodied learning um, in our PhDs, and that's why we wanted to devise a panel. Um, and you want to say something about the kind of wider context of things? Yeah, yeah. so exactly. As you said, we've been colleagues since, well, I guess, even before that. But mm -hmm. uh, we're really excited to have this opportunity to open up the space for all the dialogue that's to come. Um, we want, really want to think about this as a time of opening the space for possibility and creativity and as an invitation to connect to broader issues and thematic issues such as gender, social justice, and through our work in a unique way. Um, so going across continents to organize this panel was both a challenge but really exciting and really generative for all of us. For three different continents, booking a couple of calls to co connect was interesting between Australia, UK, and Canada. Um, but we did it, and here we are, and we're really excited to share this with all of you, the conversations we've had, um, and looking at the connections that have really helped strengthen our scholarships um, within and between gender studies and martial arts. Um, so we hope that this continues and that this panel can be a reminder and an inspiration for more engagement and collaboration in the future. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce the first, uh, each panelist. Um, and you'll have 20 minutes, and then we're going to have um, kind of round table general discussion. Um, I'll give a couple of summary comments and then we'll open it to the, the floor. Um, so, the first speaker um, is uh, Dr. Alex Shannon, um, principal lecturer. Actually, would you mind giving up the. Um, this, yeah, while I'm just introducing, sorry. Um, uh, principal lecturer at the School of Sport and Health Sciences at the University of Brighton. Thanks, Gina. Um, just testing this mic. Can you all hear me at the back? Lovely. I woke up this morning having completely lost my voice after an event last week, so I'm going to have to hide behind the mic. Sorry about that, folks. Um, but hopefully we'll be OK. Um, I've got the QR code there. If you want to scan, um, there's a reference page at the end, which I'm not going to dwell on. So if you do want to have a look at the references, then they're, they're on that. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to, uh, to hit that. Okay, um, so this is a topic that uh, I have written about before, a few years ago, um, a paper that was, uh, a short paper that looked at sort of some theoretical issues around uh, what it means when athletes um, go through this thing that we, we refer to as sexualization. If you um, are familiar with the sociology of sport, and a few people here uh, from sports studies backgrounds, you'll probably have seen plenty of studies that look at this kind of thing. The media representation of female athletes, one of the very common trends that's been observed through about four or five decades worth of research, is uh, this kind of tendency to reduce female athletes to their sexuality and to construct their value primarily uh, in terms of how good they look um, on camera. Um, this is something that hasn't gone away in those five decades worth of observing what's happening in sport. Um, but what I'm going to look at today is the idea that perhaps it might have changed a little bit. Um, and that in the context of martial arts studies, there's some trends that are probably worth our attention um, to avoid kind of getting sort of drawn into what's become a bit of an orthodoxy, uh, certainly in uh, sociology of sport, in feminist media studies perhaps, of treating the sexualization of female athletes as always uh, in the same way as evidence perhaps of um, cultural dupes being trapped in the patriarchal construction of gender norms, uh, reduced to nothing except how they're valued in the male gaze, etc., etc. There's maybe a little bit more nuance to what's going on. It's basically what I want to point out today. Not to suggest um, that those old critiques are wrong. Um, I think Paul's opening did quite a good job of uh, prefacing this. These are just different theories, different ways of approaching the same um, ontological reality. What I also want to try and do um, is move this dialogue on this particular topic from what tends to be largely a theoretically driven um, sort of trading of, of essays arguing one way or another um, into the realms of dare I say, empirical research. Maybe we can do a little bit more to figure out what's actually happening as these um, quote-unquote new trends emerge and mature. So, 
Um, for those not familiar, by the way, this is um, this is Ebony Bridges on the uh, on stage right on the left of the image. Um, she uh, was at that point a world champion boxer fighting um, Shannon O'Connell, um, and this is her at a weigh-in. She's developed this as, as kind of the thing that she does. She weighs in in sexy lingerie with makeup on, and at this this particular moment, she also unveiled to the world that she joined OnlyFans. If anyone doesn't know what OnlyFans is, um, it's a little bit like Instagram. Um, except you have to pay to see what people put on their OnlyFans feed. So, you know, it generally tends to be porn. Uh, people do use it for other things, um, but it's, it's widely kind of known for that. So Ebony Bridges, professional boxer, um, does the sexy weigh-ins, and she's on OnlyFans, as are quite a few other athletes in this field. So there's four um, slides that I want to get through. I'll try to stick to time. On each one, I'll sort of do a little bit of... Uh, sort of overview of what's going on, explain uh, the images, and then point towards what I think could be a profitable and useful way to explore this problem um, using different research approaches to try and put a bit more meat on the bones of our theoretical understanding of this, uh, this trend. So firstly, um, the idea of the Glamazon. Um, nice little portmanteau, obviously, of um, Glamorous and Amazon. Um, the, uh, I think I put it there, maybe not on this slide, but the sailors and weaving paper on the reference list does a, a reasonably good job of, t of spelling out what this, uh, this concept means. Um, in a nutshell, we could use this term glamazon to refer to um, constructions of femininity that are at once both glamorous in our typical um, construction of that term, as in sort of heterosexy feminine, um, but at the same time also emphasising uh, power, muscular uh, bodies, bodies that are capable of fighting, bodies that are capable of exerting dominance over others uh, and exerting power on their surroundings and so on. So, um, bottom image there, that's, that's Ebony Bridges again um, after she landed a knockout blow on O'Connell um, in the fight that preceded that weigh in. So, there she is, you know, she's on the one hand, she's got that sort of sexiness, but also she's got that power. Um, those two things pretty much coexisting in Ebony Bridges' construction um, of who she is as a, uh, as a media personality, as a, an entity on the world stage. Uh, the top image, um, I don't know if anyone follows CrossFit. Um, if you don't know what CrossFit is, that's a kind of competitive fitness. Um, basically being the fastest person to do lots of press-ups in a nutshell. Um, competitive CrossFitters uh, actually can make an awful lot of money by being fitness influencers, by being sponsored, uh, and so on. Um, the top left there, that's Danny Spiegel. She's a very, very famous CrossFit competitor who posts a lot of images of her body, uh, a muscular, powerful body, um, sometimes lifting weights and training, other times doing overtly sort of feminized, sexy things, dancing and so on. Um, she's very much, a, you know, blurring those two kind of constructions of um, the supposedly, uh, supposedly masculine aspect of a fit, strong, powerful, moving body and the supposedly feminine uh, aesthetic as well. And then um, if anyone uh, has been paying any attention uh, living in the UK over the last few months, you'll know what Gladiators is. That's Diamond, one of the new batch of Gladiators. Again, if you don't know what Gladiators is, uh, just do yourself a favour and Google it. It's, it's great fun. You'll enjoy it. Um, and arguably, uh, I think the, the female gladiators have been a bit of a, a breath of fresh air, departing from what was kind of a flagrantly sexualised model in the old series. Um, the female gladiators in this series are unapologetically powerful and strong women. Um, and Diamond, that's there, her there, and, and some others as well, um, clearly fit this Glamazon model. They have, as I put on the slide, um, you know, some elements of traditional... Um, Western beauty ideals, uh, but at the same time, powerful muscular bodies that are clearly agentic um, and able to get the job done. So this is what we're talking about, this, this kind of Glamazonian um, image. Um, if you spend any kind of time looking through fitness uh, inspiration content on Instagram, you'll see an awful lot of this. This is not a niche thing. This is not only in combat sports, hence my use of these two non-combat sports examples. It's very much um, uh, you know, a, a cultural trend. Um, on the one hand, yes, this is different, um, the muscles, the power, etc. On the other hand, it's not that different. We're still sort of seeing women's bodies being at least partially valued um, on how attractive they are and how well they appeal to um, the supposedly heterosexual male gaze. What would be quite interesting, I think, is a bit of context here, and this is not um, something that hasn't been done. This has been done quite a bit, in fact. We had a presentation, I think, two years ago that did this at Lausanne. I haven't seen the paper published uh, in a journal article yet, but looking at how female boxers constructed um, their, their sort of self-branding and, and what have you on Instagram, um, it would be quite interesting to see a, combina a combination of qualitative and quantitative uh, research methods to see what kind of meanings are female athletes constructing when they pose in these 
muscular, powerful, yet also sexy pictures? What are they trying to suggest uh, it means to be them? What is their identity work uh, pointing towards? Um, and also, how widespread is this kind of thing? What does this glamazon um, construction look like in terms of its presence and its breadth? What are its alternatives? Um, how much space does it take up um, in uh, the world of professional combat sports? Slightly more theoretical, one of the consistent arguments um, that sort of decries female athlete sexual uh, sexualization is the idea that this is ultimately a form of objectification. There's a lot of objectification that goes on in sports. We treat athletes as objects in numerous ways. Sexualization is one of those, or at least it has uh, been argued to be one of those. Um, but what happens when sexualization and the presentation of a, of a heterosexy feminine self is not easily reduced to just the process of objectification. You're only valuable as an object for people to consume in a sexual way. What happens when the women doing it are also using it as a way to constitute a sense of themselves as a particular type of woman when they're rejecting certain, um, let's say, repressive ideas about women, uh, women's need of modesty, when they're casting off um, the, uh, the sort of imperative to be a good role model for little girls uh, or for, for children uh, more generally. Um, this is a point that Sarah Cruz makes quite well in her analysis of Ebony Bridges, in fact, that the discourses that Bridges herself constructs around her sexualized performances. She's not being the person that you're supposed to be. She's not being the good girl boxer. Um, and she's quite happy with that because it means she's doing her own thing and she's able to be her own boss. The older um, sort of critiques of sexual objectification tend to stress this idea um, that women are placed in this position by external forces, that they're exploited by men uh, who, are, who are in control, who have authorship uh, of this process. Um, but actually, if you think about the way that social media functions, particularly OnlyFans, where you monetize your own content and you, know, you keep most of that money, you pay a little bit to the platform, but you keep it otherwise, you also are the one who's producing those images. You have creative control over that. So it's quite different in terms of um, the role of the person who's placing themselves um, in this position. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about Ronda Rousey because I think you know, most of us who, who've cared to pay attention to her have probably heard all we need to. Uh, but the DNB thing, you might need a little reminder that stands for um, don't be a do-nothing bitch, which is a lesson that Rousey proudly learned from her mother um, and something that she uh, became very famous for briefly um, for, for uh, sort of putting this over. You know, if you're a woman in sports, you have to take control of your own destiny and you should be proud of your body because it's built for this, this important, powerful thing. And she was saying all of this at the same time um, as being quite happy uh, with posing. You can see the T-shirt there, uh, the image there, posing in her underwear on her bed. You know, this is part of me constructing myself actively. This is who I am, this whole package of me and I don't need to fit into an either or stereotype you know either you're the good girl either uh, the bad girl so she's protesting against that as a way to to say you know we're going to be our own people um, the last image there uh, you, again if you follow bare knuckle boxing which probably most people don't follow it's still a bit niche uh, but this was a, a fighter Ty Emery her name is she just scored a knockout victory um, and immediately after knocking her opponent out she climbs up onto the ropes uh, and flashes the crowd um, we had an interesting little, little discussion on the Facebook page, Martial Arts Studies Facebook page, about the feelings associated with knockouts. It'd be quite interesting to see how that research project is progressing. I'm not sure if Martin's here, actually. Um, but this is, you know, an immediate aftermath of knocking somebody out. What's the first thing you do? Flash the crowd. Um, Ty Emery was interviewed about this, obviously, all over combat sports media. And one of the things that she consistently said, this is me kind of, you know, I'm being myself and I'm showing other women the way, right? We can all do this. We can all sort of reject society's mores and norms uh, and just be who we want to be. This is my Statue of Liberty moment, which perhaps is a little bit confusing if we think that progression for women um, involves um, you know, not being sexualized. So framing it very, uh, very differently. I think perhaps the question that needs to animate our efforts here is, you know, what's actually driving this? The people that find themselves in this situation, how do they give meaning to these actions? What are their intentions? What are they doing it for? Um, and to what ends do they believe uh, it leads? Uh, in terms of their uh, sort of active construction of their identities. One of the themes for this panel is all about self-determination. Um, and what seems to be the case from listening to characters like Ronda Rousey, Ebony Bridges, Ty Emery, is that by embracing uh, an overtly sexualized sense of femininity, they are constituting themselves in a way that's true to themselves. Um, we can't really get away from this, though. Um, these are all promotional sports, boxing, mixed martial arts, kickboxing, bare knuckle, wrestling, professional wrestling, promotional sports depend upon um, your marketability. 
It doesn't really matter how good you are at sports. You, you obviously have to have skills. You have to be capable of performing. But it's not like in football where if you win the match, you get the points and your team gets promoted and you might win the championship. In promotional sports, you have to win, but you also have to capture the attention of the promoters. So clearly, uh, we need to start thinking about um, how athletes construct and develop and maintain different types of career capital. One form of career capital would be one's fighting skills. Another form of career capital, for those who follow mixed martial arts, you'll know all about characters like Conor McGregor, good fighter, but that's not really why he's so famous. It's not really why he's such a, a millionaire, not really why he got the role in Roadhouse, right? You haven't seen that yet? Maybe do yourself a favour and you know, fast forward the bits that he's in. Um, but career capital is a very important construct. If you want to succeed in a sport where objective performances are important but subjective judgments of those performances are more important, then you need to have something about you um, that you bring to the table that makes you unique, that makes you bookable. That's definitely the case in professional wrestling, um, where of course we're dealing with um, you know, scripted encounters. Um, so promotional sports require entrepreneurialism and they require an ability to construct a marketable sense um, of your, your brand, of who you are. Um, arguably, this is, this is what these women are doing. Often when you read their accounts of, of, you know, what are you up to, what's your plans and so on, what are, you, what are you engaged in, they'll use this term, I'm a businesswoman or I'm an entrepreneur. This comes through quite often um, and it frames these kinds of decisions, no doubt. Um, Paige Van Zandt, to uh, the MMA followers, you'll probably remember who she was. Uh, she's still competing. Uh, she very recently fought Elbrook. Um, Elbrook is, um, well, she's, she's not a boxer turned porn performer. She is a porn performer um, turned boxer. Um, Paige Van Zandt allegedly, uh, well, she, she said that she made more money in one day um, after starting OnlyFans than she did in nine fights uh, for the UFC which tells us something perhaps about how badly remunerated UFC fighters are, which is another question perhaps for, for another time. Um, but it also tells us quite an important thing about how an athlete can use their physical capital um, in exchange for economic capital to lean into the Bourdieu and stuff. Perhaps taking your clothes off for people that are willing to pay to watch that is a safer, better, more uh, long-lasting way to make money out of your body than put it in line for brain damage uh, time after time. So that kind of decision-making is likely to inform what's going on here. Um, there's quite a few things I could say here. I, I'll skip forward just a little bit because I'm noting that I've only got five minutes left. Um, but we need to think about the people who are making decisions about what counts um, as valuable. One of the, the, the sort of maxims that I lean on quite often with my students for this kind of stuff is to think about who defines it um, and by what criteria. In the context of promotional sports, who defines a fighter's value? More to the point here, who defines a woman's value, a female fighter's value? Dana White very famously said that women will never fight in the UFC. Uh, only a couple of years before he did a complete 180 on that, signed Ronda Rousey. Um, after, perhaps, arguably, part of Ronda Rousey's appeal was her looks. Maybe it was a little bit more than that. It was her ability to generate controversy and to leverage fan interest. Um, Dana White embraced Ronda Rousey, embraced women's mixed martial arts at that point. You know, who defines it and by what criteria? Dana White defined it, and he said it wasn't valuable until the criteria changed and he realised he could make some money. I've also put Vince McMahon up there for, for pro wrestling um, fans. You'll know who he is. If you don't, um, the longtime owner of the WWE um, and ruled that organisation with an iron fist. Um, the, the lady down right in the bottom left, uh, Mandy Rose, was fired from the WWE pretty um, promptly uh, after she posted content to her uh, equivalent of OnlyFans um, that violated the WWE's um, terms of use. So when uh, athletes are, are trying to generate this kind of career capital, it's quite important to remember um, that they're doing so in a very fraught situation where their careers can be cut short, can be ended um, you know, pretty much at the, um, at the whims of the, the people, almost always men, um, who control this space. This is certainly worth remembering whenever we start to think about you know, subject. Uh, you know, constructing an identity and being the author of your own uh, brand and all that kind of stuff. You know, this takes place in an economic context where you're not the ultimate decision maker uh, as an athlete. Um, perhaps it's difficult to really know how, how can we measure this? How can we quantify this? Can we really get reliable data on how much athletes earn? Probably not. Um, but we could perhaps design a study that tracks um, social media engagements and followers as a form of measuring people's social capital. What happens to a female athlete's career uh, when she starts to do this kind of stuff, when she starts performing this kind of 
glamazon sexualization thing? Does it really generate more interest? Does it lead to a, a, an increase in attention? Uh, and what were the connotations for that, for how other women who don't want to do that uh, might develop their careers? What kind of implications might that have for equity across these sports? Um, finally, I haven't said a great deal about this. Um, I definitely recommend Justin Hamilton's research to anyone who's interested in, in looking at um, contemporary work on, uh, on gender and mixed martial arts. Um, Justin's not looking at this specifically, but it's one of the things that crops up in his work interviewing uh, female MMA fighters. Um, generally speaking, uh, the women who are most able to benefit from this, this kind of phenomenon seem to be white women. Um, it generally you know, follows kind of normal um, constructions of, of beauty, that it's, it's white women, it's able-bodied women, usually blonde, um, who fit that sort of stereotypical ideal. Um, thank you. Uh, I've put a couple of pictures up there. There's obviously women who aren't white, who, who um, in that context, we've got Michelle Waterson, who's Asian, and we've got uh, Mackenzie Dern, who's Latina, uh, women who kind of present a little bit as white, maybe, uh, in some contexts. How easy is it for people from other groups who are generally frozen out of that kind of... Um, that kind of scene, how are they able to, to leverage this? Um, but more importantly, I've put down there the Santa, Santa Nicola et al. review paper. Uh, it's not about martial arts or sports per se, but it's a general overview of research findings on uh, the effects of sexualization in the media. Um, you know, it probably no surprise to anyone to learn that still, you know, exposure to sexualized imagery tends to predict a number of um, negative uh, psychological responses in women and men. Uh, for women, generally, we're thinking about um, poor body image issues. We're thinking about eating disorders. For men, uh, generally, um, a, an easier embrace of sort of more toxic aspects of masculinity. I'm you know, summarizing this very quickly. Um, I've put a picture of Just Bleed Guy on there uh, as a way to kind of get us to think about who's looking at these images, right? Are we really sort of drilling down into the nuances of how does Ebony Bridges constitute an authentic sense of self through this performance? Is that, is that really landing with all the people looking at this stuff? Or is it just more of the same but with slightly different window dressing? How is this actually being received by audiences? This is kind of the linchpin um, of, of where I'm leading with this. We need to test that. We need to have a think about what kind of impact this is having um, with particularly these, I'm saying tentatively new um, types of sexualization. Is that leading to a different kind of outcome? Some research would suggest that sexualizing a more diverse um, range of body types is either less harmful or in some cases has some positive benefits. So it would be very interesting, um, if anyone's up for this, to design a study that looks at how this kind of imagery um, leads to maybe the same or maybe some different effects, particularly um, when we're thinking about the types of audiences um, that are viewing it. And with three seconds left, I'll finish. Thanks.